One, let me know if you can't hear me, but I'm going to walk around so hopefully everybody can hear me in the back. Um, and I want to thank everyone for coming out. I got to say, uh, I've been nervous, um, actually been nervous for the last uh, two days about uh, this event, mainly because of the weather. So we had, uh, we had a big event at Happen last night, uh, a creative session where uh, we're working on a new project. I'll share with you in a minute about it. Um, but when I looked at the forecast and then the phone started ringing and people canceling, um, we, last night we had all this food for everyone, which, uh, you know, out, I think we were expecting 25 or 30 people and about 10 to 12 people showed up for the event last night. Um, so if anybody has like a special uh, event where you need some food this afternoon, just <laughs> let me know because I have either that you can come over to my house for ginger cookies and bean dip tonight because that's what I'm going to be eating, I think. Um, but I was really, you know, the weather, I was like, oh man, and people started coming and uh, we had all the stuff prepared and then only like 10 people were there. But I got to tell you, I couldn't sleep last night because I got so excited after the, the session was over because out of the history it happened and all my experience in creative building with ideas and people, it was probably the best creative session that I've ever had. And uh, I, I was like, why was that? What happened last night that was so special? Um, what brought all these people together and, and, and why did we get so much stuff done, so much good stuff done? And all the things that I was nervous about, the weather, the ice, things that kept people away, I think is what actually brought us all together. Because the people that showed up were people that had to struggle to get there. You know, they went through the cold, they went through the ice. One person said Ludlow was backed up, Vine Street was closed down. They made it, right? And I thought, that's probably where we started, was that they started with a struggle and the people who were there really wanted to be there. And today, with the same weather. Thank you so much for coming out and seeing us because I know that you went through a little bit of a struggle to be here and hopefully we'll have a great, great session because of it. I'm here because of childhood, all right? Jeremy called me and said, hey, we're doing this, this session, this theme about childhood. Would you like to speak? And the first thing I thought was, well, you know what? We can all relate to childhood, right? We all have gone through it. We understand it, and we've all gone through it on different levels or different events and activities. So I thought, okay, I will do that. I can do that. I, it's on childhood. And the reason I'm here is because I started a, a business 15 years ago called Happen Incorporated. So Happen is a nonprofit agency, and our whole goal is to bring families together through creative exercises and activities. So. They're wacky, they're crazy, they're fun for all levels. It's fun for a parent and it's also fun for an adult. Our goal is three things, to entertain, educate, and empower. So those three things, if I can do that, right, I know that I can, one, capture your attention. We're gonna have fun, whether you're a six-year-old or a 60-year-old, you're gonna have fun in our space. Once I have that, then I have an opportunity to teach you either about art, about a life lesson, you're there, you're tuned in. And then through art, making things in our studio, you can actually leave with your own creation, something that you're gonna put up on the shelf, something that you're gonna remember forever. That is Happen Incorporated. We bring families together through creative exercises and, and activities. These are, I'll show you some of the examples. These are our happen characters. So this is Eno, the one point perspective alien. He knows all about one point perspective. This is cowboy value. He's half light value, half gray value, and teaches the gray scale. Uh, this is our junk man who teaches how you can draw through found objects. All right? We have all these different characters. Everything is a surprise. These characters come out, and they really are the people, the characters teach the classes. Um, we now have, I think, 
there's over 70 fully scripted out 45 minute sessions full of characters and wardrobe um, and it's quite a, a, an event and I'm going to run through some of our programs so we started out um, here actually in Coryville we had a, a space up on Cory Street where uh, we just did one class and we repeated it over and over and over and then it built into six classes um, and and so on so then we actually expanded out to different programs too. So I'm going to run through really quick some of our programs. Some of you might have seen them. Some of you might have been a part of them. I see a lot of familiar faces and volunteers that have come out today. So Community Canvas is where we take a famous painting, we blow it up mural size, cut it in diagonal strips, and then weave it into fences in the community. The kids learn about the artist and about the artwork, and then it stays up for 30 days. What's really great is they also learn about community. We define communities as, as not just where you live, it's how you live with other people. It's how you live with other people. These community canvases are shared all over Cincinnati. We do about 50 a year. Um, they stay up for 30 days. I think there's three of them up right now. If you come see me tomorrow at the Museum Center, at the Children's Museum, there'll be another one going up there in the lobby. So community canvas um, really originated uh, with a need. So we were doing an event. The event was supposed to be in a lot. The lot got fenced in at the last minute, and I was like, what, am, what are we going to do, right? And so we were studying American Gothic for that session, that activity, and um, I came up with, okay, well, let's just figure out how we can mount it up there. How are we going to do that? Well, we had to put it into strips, and we went to Kinko's. It took us forever to do. We figured it out. It stayed up. A person I worked with in advertising saw it, had a print company, gave us an NCAT, our first big printer. We went from doing one that year to next year we did 27. Kinko's came on board, sponsored us, helped us out, and now we do 50 a year. This is Happens Toy Lab. It's where you can come in. How many people have heard of Happens Toy Lab? Awesome. All right. I don't know. I even have to hardly explain it. I'll, I'll go through it real quick. Happens Toy Lab is where you can make your own toys out of recycled toy parts. Okay? People donate their old and broken toys. Kids learn not just about recycling, but upcycling, taking something old and turn it into something new again. So far, we've saved over four tons of plastic through kids' minds and their imaginations, creating their own, leaving with their own creations. It's been a wonderful, wonderful activity. I must go back up a little bit and say, our Happen Studio, everything is free. Everything is free. Next door, it's Happen's Toy Lab. is a studio where you can come in and build these toys. It costs $10, but the proceeds goes to offset all the free programs that we do right next door in the studio. So we do birthday parties and all kinds of activities. We now travel, we have a mobile unit, all right, which Chad Reynolds in the back, I gotta say thank you from Battery. They actually, you can wave your hand there, everybody's seen. You know, a few years ago he came to me and said, hey, I'm working with this company called Nike in Portland, and we'd like to do a creative activity with them with, with your toy lab. And um, we were able to build a mobile unit air freighted out to Portland. I got to work with all these directors of different brands. It was an awesome experience. And then um, we are still using that mobile unit today. So this summer we'll be down at Washington Park. We just made an agreement with 3CDC. So twice a month for four months you can come down and build free toys <coughs> at Washington Park. Let's play with clay. Another one of our ceramics programs where a volunteer came to me and said, you know what, I'd love to do ceramics. I didn't have any experience in ceramics. And uh, they said, he said, you got to try it out. You just have to do it. We worked on it, worked on it, tried to figure it out. We finally got a kiln. We raised enough money. We did a set, a series of classes. And it was good. It was a good experience, right? Kids went through it. I think I had 10 kids that went through that program. What I learned from that, the biggest thing I learned from that is that I'm never really going to be able to quantify the, what, what we teach. As far as it affects a child later on in life, or maybe even that day or that week or 20 years later, I'm not going to be able to quantify exactly the effect that our classes' activities make. And the example of this is that uh, we had a child that went through, I'm sorry, went through uh, the Let's Play with Clay program. And I, you know, he was quiet. He went through it. Uh, he seemed to like it, but he wasn't overly excited about it. Um, we had to go pick him up for an, another event about two weeks after um, that program had ended. And um, he wasn't at the community center where he was supposed to be, so I had to track him down in the neighborhood. I found him coming out of a little grocery store. He had bought some candy, put down his bag, and he flashed me what I thought was a, a gang sign. 
And then as I was walking closer to him, he did it again. And I was just like, what is going on here? This kid was like 12, almost 13. And when I finally came up close to him, um, he did it again. I was like, what are you, what do you flash me a gang sign for? And he said, no, no, no. And he showed me again. And he was showing me what you learn when you place your hands in the first position of throwing on the wheel. <laughs> and it blew my mind. I didn't talk to his mom, and his mom said that every time he was bringing home a, a, a piece of pottery, right, that object, that empowerment, he was taking it to his school and showing everybody. Not that there was show and tell going on, all right? He was just taking it in, right? And I thought, wow, wow. This is something special. This volunteer had told me, hey, you're going to make a difference with clay. I didn't believe him. You know, I was like, oh, I've had two ceramic classes in my whole life. You know, what am I doing? It has changed not only our business, what we do, but it has changed lives throughout all of the greater Cincinnati area. Kids love ceramics and that empowerment of being able to create something that you can share and it can be functional has been wonderful. This is Lights, Camera, Learning in Action. This is where our summer program where kids can actually come in and write, direct, and produce their own film. Um, these kids are actually part of a program called Faces Without Places. They're homeless children in Cincinnati. And before I started this program, I had no idea that there were homeless children all right, in Cincinnati. I never even thought about it. Right? I got a phone call from the company, and they said, hey, would you like to do some programming with this? We have homeless children here. And I was like, yeah, how can you say no, right? And I thought, well, what are we going to do? And we started to build this program. I love film. It's, 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 I love movies. I'm going to probably refer to several movies today. And, you know, out of this program where kids get to write, direct, and produce, and actually the empowerment is we show their short film. They have to, they have to make everything, too, out of white, uh, black paint and white foam core, right? Out of sheets. They have to make all their costumes. Everything is created. And then we take that film, we, we, it's about a five minute film, and then we, we, we show it, we premiere it. And over the last five years, it's shown at the Museum Center, but it's not just that. We actually do the red carpet. We have people out getting their autographs. It's like, it's amazing. And then at the end, the big surprise is a limo pulls up and they all get limo rides back to Project or to Faces Without Places. So. Um, this is the power of creativity. And we teach these kids, and especially this group of kids, right? These kids have nothing. They have nothing but their minds and their imaginations. And we teach them that it's a power. That creativity is a power that they can use not just in art or making a film, but they can use it dealing with math or science or dealing with their little brother. And the coolest thing is, is that once they use it and they have it, that nobody and I tell them nobody can take it away from them. It's theirs forever. I love gardening. Um, you know, and, and I've been blessed that I've been able to put together a program called Happens Do Goods. And Do Goods started from, um, you know, I, I'm actually a pretty fanatic about gardening. So I, I, I grow things. Um, and I grow always way too much than what I can eat. And so um, in my backyard in Northside, what I'd do is I, I'd grow a whole bunch of stuff and then I, I didn't know what to do with it. So I'd put baskets out on my fences because my neighbors didn't have gardens. And then I'd fill them up with vegetables and um, put them over the fences. And when my neighbors want more, they just put the, the baskets back over, right? And I'd fill them up some more. So that's really what started Do Goods because I started thinking about there's got to be other people that are just like me that like to produce, right? They like to make stuff. They like to grow stuff. And what do we do with all that produce that's left over? So we started a farmer's market for kids. So in August, September and August, you can go to our space on Saturdays and we put out all these vegetables and um, kids come and, and, and get the vegetables, right? But it's called Do Goods because it's, it's like a farmer's market, but you don't pay with money. All, right? All the child has to do is write down one good thing they're going to do that day, and then it's worth three vegetables or a handful of cherry tomatoes. Right? And the kids are learning about good nutrition and, and, and proper eating, but also, also giving back to the community. And then we collect all those do-goods and then put them up in a big poster um, for the neighborhood to be able to see what we harvested, which is all the good things in the neighborhood. That do-goods program, that just wanting to grow something is what it started with, has now turned into a garden 
where we offer um, educational programs. Um, it's been awesome. We've got high schoolers involved, college students involved. Um, then it grew to a flower garden. So all of a sudden there's an empty lot that I found out about in Northside. And um, I got the owner to rent it to us for a dollar a month and uh, our dollar a year and then we turned it into something special a surprise to the neighborhood it's bigger than life kids walk in all our plants are bigger than they are they're totally immersed in nature it's a place for people we've had everything from book clubs use it to kids having picnics there a lot of the area around it it's all apartments so it's pretty dense people don't have backyards so they use this area it's become a place where people gather they take pride in their community. Um, stuff that I just, I'll tell you one story real quick. Last year I was in the garden and a woman, there's an apartment building across the street. A woman came over to me and said, my mother really loves your garden. She lives in this building. And I said, come tell her, come down and talk to me. I'm here like probably every other afternoon watering. I mean, we can talk. And she's like, well, she can't get out much. Um, she doesn't get around. And I was like, well, what window is she in? At least I can wave to her, right? And she said, well, she's actually on the side of the building and she can't see very well. And I just looked at her like I didn't understand what was going on. And then the woman said she can smell the roses when the wind blows into her apartment, right? I could never quantify that. I could never even plan on it. I couldn't think about what that garden would mean to someone in the neighborhood, to that woman, right? I just love the garden. I just like to plant and grow stuff. This is our new garden. So that session last night that I was talking about that I'm so excited about. This is the biggest green space left undeveloped in Northside. We've been working on it for three years. We've been working with the Northside Business Association, with the city, um, and it's off of Hoffner Street. These are the plans. In April, um, there will be a, a ribbon cutting from the city uh, where our first event's gonna be a big Easter egg hunt the Saturday before Easter. Um, think of happen as what I've explained to you as full of surprises and fun for everybody. This is happen outside. So I'm super excited about it and uh, last night's session was just incredible. The amount of things that we're going to be able to do by bringing people together in this area is going to be uh, off the charts. So um, look for that coming soon. This is a new program called Happens Breadwinners. Um, uh, Metro Scooter, I got Dave Ruby owns Metro Scooters, a friend of mine. He showed me about, I don't know, five or six years ago. He, he's like, yeah, we make our own shirts. You know, he screens his own shirts. And I, he showed me how to do it. So I started screen printing my own shirts. Not, not for happen at that point, but just for fun. I was making Christmas gifts for my family and friends. And uh, then I started making them for happen. I thought, oh, I can do that. You know, so we started. And then about, oh, uh, it's been about three years ago, they did a study with kids, they did a focus group with kids. They interviewed them, said, what do you want to do in Northside? We're trying to keep kids out of trouble. What do you want to do? And they made a whole list. And the first thing I want to do is make money. I got it, all right? I want to make money. And about fourth thing was that they wanted to design their own clothes. And I thought, I don't know, that's fun. I'm doing it already. Let's see if we can figure it out. So this is our first teen group. It's 13 to 17 year olds. They actually screen and make their own line of shirts. It's called Breadwinners. They want to bring home the dough, right? <laughs> and it's awesome. They are earning money now. I mean, it's taken us, what, two years to get it off the ground. But I got six teens that are there every Tuesday night. We eat together, we hang out together, and then we work together. And they sell their shirts for $11, right? $1 goes back to graffiti removal on north side, so they're giving back. $3 goes to buy more shirts, and the rest of the money is split up amongst the teens. Last week, we split up the money from the, last, from the Christmas sales. They all got $26.50 each, and you would have thought it was $1,000, <laughs> right? I mean, they were super, super psyched. I don't know, I just like to make t-shirts, you know? So, Happens programs, these are all, the, uh, we got tons of programs. We got our color team, our after school programs. Um, we're in, in and out of schools. I'm in a high school this afternoon doing some talks. Uh, Pop Arf is where you can make art with your dog. All right, it's a lot of fun if you love animals. Jump and Thump is our, and our Healthy Hearts is our exercise programs. Hesapatasm World is where you can, it stands for hearing, seeing, feeling, tasting, and smelling. 
It's where you can explore the world through your senses. Right. And peanut butter and what? That's our, that's our taste off contest we do every year. So you can put together whatever peanut butter concoction um, and we have a taste off. This one last year was peanut butter and what's healthy. This year it's peanut butter and what's crazy. So I have no idea what to expect. <laughs> so this is Happen Incorporated. I got to tell you, I have no, uh, I don't have any degrees in childhood development. I don't have, I, any really, uh, well, I, I, I have hardly any experience in working directly with kids, teaching. I have no teaching certificates other than I have a master's of art, which allows me to, I guess, teach on the college level, but not working with, with, with youngsters, with, with children. But the reason I'm here is that I've taken all those experiences that we all have, childhood, right, and I've built a business around it. I look back at my life, at the whatever experiences that I went through, and decided, you know what, there are some challenges, and I can help other people, other kids, other families, probably with those same challenges, because we've all experienced pretty much the same thing on different levels, right, of going through childhood. So the only reason I'm here is not because I've got, you know, this tremendous background in studies, it's just because I looked at my life and said, hey, you know what? I'm really good at something. And what I found was, I'm an expert at being a kid. <laughs> That's what I am, right? I've spent almost all my life being a kid, right? All those hours, and I love this because, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break it down. When I've watched these videos before, these talks before, um, I've always wanted to do this, so it kind of makes me look smart, I think, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> so, it comes from Latin term, expertus, which is to try, you know? That's all I do. I just try. But because I've tried, I've gained all this very valuable experience of being a kid. Best thing is, no high IQ required, right? It doesn't mean how smart you are, you don't have to go through, you know, all these testing. You just got to try. Computer programmer takes 15, over 15,000 hours to become an expert. Economist, 26,000. Astrophysicist, almost 27,000. A neurosurgeon, 42,000 hours to become an expert. Kid, I put in 147,000 hours <laughs> of being a kid, right? I mean, I go to bed a kid, I wake up a kid, I went through struggles, I learned, I explored, you know, I climbed the ladder, literally, because I was on a bunk bed, right? <laughs> you did all these things, right, from the time you're 1 to 18, that is so valuable, not only in shaping your life, but being able to shape other people's lives too, kids. And I feel like that we all have a responsibility as adults to be able to help shape other lives, other kids' lives, other people's childhoods. How do I become an expert? It's pretty easy. You got a mom and a dad, right? I mean, from there, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life growing up as an expert. My mother was just... My mother's awesome. She, uh, she was a nurse. Um, she uh, started a, well, she started a vocational school um, that really was out of a problem. She had a really tough time going through nursing school and learning terminology. And back then there wasn't a book for terminology, it wasn't all these things. So she decided, she went out and found a grant and she put together a book and then a class on nursing, on terminology to help other kids, other students be able not to have the challenges that she had. Um, that she started with 13 students. By the time she retired, she had 14 different medical programs in vocational school, dealing with not just kids but also adults and, 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 and night classes and pharmacy, all kinds of uh, is an incredible amount of work that she accomplished. All because she like, looked back at her life and what did she do? She had some challenges that she had wanted to overcome and how she could help other people. She's a nurse. She loves to help people.
right? She loves, she's the most caring person. When I was in college, I had a roommate that walked in, we were there, my mom was visiting, we walked in, and he walked in and he had holes in his shoes. And then when he left, he's like, she's like, I gotta get Todd some new shoes. And I was like, what do you mean? She goes, hey, his shoes are, look horrible, got holes in them and everything. I was like, no, Todd's very prideful. He's not gonna, you know, if you went out and bought him a pair of shoes, it would make him feel worse, you know? He was working two part-time jobs. He didn't have any help from his parents, but he was not gonna take anything from anybody, right? He was trying to prove it that he could be on his own, and I knew that. And so my mom just wouldn't have it. I went on to a class, all right, a, a night class, and what I found out was that while I was gone, my mom went and knocked on all the doors and got these guys out. And she had them write down their names on a piece of paper and draw their shoes, their, their, their foot, right? A week later, this delivery happened. This big box of shoes showed up. And everybody had shoes with their names on it. I mean, you name it, there was every type of shoe, every type of size, but they were specifically for all the people in my hallway, all the guys. Todd got a brand new pair of shoes had no idea, right? That's the type of woman that my mother is. My father, he's a character, real character. He grew up, when I grew up, he was a DJ. He was a wacky DJ um, <laughs> on AM stations, right? Um, and just crazy. They do all kinds of stuff um, back then. I mean, they don't do that stuff now, but, but back then, I mean, his claim to fame was that he got hired and fired from every radio station in the Louisville area. Um, <laughs> And he could only work nights because I think that's when, I mean, they had to have DJs and that was probably the least amount of, uh, of uh, you know, trouble that he could cause is when hardly anybody's listening. But, you know, he's an electronics freak. We had stereo systems everywhere in our house. Um, but also, you know, I, I, I learned, I grew up on music. Harry Chapin and Frank Sinatra. Um, Star Wars, I mean, he would, he, would, he would blast Star Wars until the windows shook in, in our house. Um, and I learned something very, very valuable from him, though. And, uh, you know, I love music, too. And growing up, this was one of my favorite bands. <laughs> and so one day, I was watching this TV show, and Gene Simmons, if you're not familiar with Kiss, um, Gene Simmons would be the, the, the one that's spitting out blood and all this theatrics and everything. And I was watching, and he said, <clears throat> he came by, and instead of him telling me to turn off the TV, he started a conversation with me which I look back on and think, that's pretty cool, you know? And he told me, he said, you know what? The world thrives on the unusual. And then he got up and he walked away, right? And before he walked out of the room, he didn't tell me to turn it off, but he did point at the TV and he said, and this guy, this guy is taking the easy way out. That was my first experience, my first learning experience of shock, versus surprise, right? Shock versus surprise. I didn't really learn and understand that until this play. My father left the world of radio, went out and got his master's in education and started a program at a, our local high school for te television, broadcasting, and theater. He created some of the most amazing theatrical plays. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I grew up basically in the theater, watching them put together sets and all kinds of, uh, well, I learned everything from those experiences. And this play was incredible because he worked with not just the, the theatrical department, but also the, the football team. And I'll explain why they came in. And they kept it all surprised because if you know the play, it's about rain. It's about this rainmaker comes in and uh, this drought this drought county and um, when you're sit when I was sitting there watching the play the very first night you could the the orchestra you know quieted down and then you could hear this pitter patter you couldn't tell what it was and they got louder and louder and louder and then all of a sudden the curtains opened up and it was raining on stage he had built with these team of students a fake stage where it was elevated, so they had gutter systems. And I'm telling you, it just wasn't raining, it was pouring down rain. The singers had umbrellas, right? You, they were kicking up water. It was raining throughout the whole stage. And a quiet, I mean, everybody in the audience was just amazed. They were surprised, right? It was beautiful. And then, you know, the, he had, had to make all this piping to make that work up, in the, up uh, in the curtain area. And then underneath the stage, they drilled holes through the stage into the basement. We had, they had a football team moving 
bu big buckets of water, right? As the water was coming through, he was doing this whole big production. It was a surprise. It was a surprise that was beautiful. It went across all ages. Everybody in that auditorium loved it and they wanted more, right? That's the difference between shock and surprise. Also, it was my first wow moment. It's the first time I ever sat back and it was really like, you know, wow. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought back? What is the very first time that you ever had that wow moment, right? What influenced that? How old were you? What was the environment? We go back to those wow moments with happen because that's what we want to create. We want to create a time that you remember forever. And those things, the definition or the things that we look at, like, is this a wow moment? Can we create it? Is that it causes overwhelming emotional response and affects everybody, everybody, all ages. You never want to forget it and you're left wanting more. Wow. That's what we try and do at Happen. We create these surprises with characters and we totally immerse you in a creative field that hopefully you walk away wanting more and you'll never forget it. Back to me being an expert. So I grew up in Jeffersonville, Indiana, a uh, two-track driveway on a piece of farmland. We had a barn, um, gosh, I mean, two creeks. Every day I was outside. We had a huge garden, right? So think about that, right? I love gardening. We had this huge garden that we would eat out of. You know, I could dig up potatoes, we'd pick the apples. We had six apple trees raspberries, grapes, all these things, right? We would cook, my mom on Saturday morning would fix hash browns and, and apple pancakes, right? Right from the field. Um, it, was a, it was a wonderful place to grow up. Um, and it affected me deeply. It's the first time I, I experienced loss. How many people have ever thought about that? What's the earliest form of loss? It doesn't have to be of, uh, with a human being. In my case, it was two peach trees that died in the field. Right? And my dad had to drag them out with a tractor. That wasn't a human loss, it's a physical loss because a tree, we look at a tree, it's beautiful, but as a kid, you're not only eating from that tree, but you're also experiencing that tree. You climb in it, you live around it, it protects you, it gives you shade, all those things. You can fall in love with an object, right? And you can remember it forever and experience a loss. And that was my first feeling of loss. Um, I had a mom, dad, and also a brother. My brother's awesome. Um, great guy, very, very successful, has helped me out tremendously. He lives in San Francisco. Um, and uh, he and I together experienced this world of nature and growing up in Jeffersonville. Um, just, I can't say enough uh, uh, about him. And then, and then there was me. There was me. And I always say there's me and then add two S's to it because um, I was a mess. <laughs> I mean, I really was. I was a mess. So um, how many people know Forrest Gump, the movie Forrest Gump? Okay. So at the beginning, Forrest Gump, he's running. Anybody remember what, what he's running, he's run, he has on? Does anybody remember? Yeah, yeah I, I had those braces. Okay. My hips turned in. I was pigeon-toed. Um, I, don't, I, I, I wore those same braces. When I saw the movie the first time, um, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about, about the movie. I knew it was a great movie. It was packed. That came on. I was bawling to the point I couldn't catch my breath. My friends thought, well, what's going on? This woman that was sitting next to me, I didn't even know her. She grabs my hand and says, and holds my hand through that porch and says, it's going to be okay. That's how, <laughs> yeah, right? But I was that kid, you know? I was that kid. And uh, on top of it, I, uh, I, I fell a lot, and so I f I'd fallen as a child, and I knocked out all my front teeth. So, um, and I tell you, you, you need front teeth to be able to, you know, eat corn on the cob or bite into an apple, but you also need your front teeth when you're learning how to talk, all right? I always say you can't pronounce, you know, your words if you can't even pronounce phonics, right? I mean, you can't, you can't get it out. And um, so I had some challenges. Um, I, was, I was definitely a mess. But real quick, the, out of those challenges, what was awesome is because two things. They put me in ballet class to strengthen my legs. 
I, I'm not a great dancer, all right, and, and, I, I, and I really enjoy ballet, but what happened from that is I learned how to draw. I learned how to draw because there was a guy there, Larry Dolliver, who would design all of the costumes, and he would come in once a week, and he would do gesture drawings while the dancers were going on, and, you know, I stood and watched him, and then after a while, he gave me a pad of paper so I could draw along with him, right? I learned how to gesture draw before I even went to college. Most people learn when you're in college, like how to hold your hand out and how, to, how the body moves and the weight and, and charcoals and everything. I was learning right there just because this guy, you know, he just said, I'll give him some paper, you know. It was amazing, changed my life. From then on, I drew and I still draw the rest of my life. Talking, it's, been t it's tough. Right? Pronouncing things. I still, I mean, it, it, I might stop today and have to, you know, guys have to help me sound something out, right? It happens all the time. But what I found was um, that I was a part of this church, and this church is Southern Baptist Church. You don't dance, but you sing a lot. And I could sing. I got able, I was able to sing, be a part of a choir, be get in front of people, right? And though I couldn't talk very well, but I could sing. And so those things, those things were just a natural progression that we didn't plan on, couldn't quantify. It's just that, you know, like Larry Dolliver, he just took some time and said, oh, here's some pencils, you can watch me, right? Then I went to high school. High school was pretty tough. My family then fell apart. Um, I don't know what happened. I still don't know exactly what happened, but it happens to over 60% of families, you know right now is that they get a divorce and I, I understand that um, but what was crazy about mine was that my father taught at the same high school that I went to school at and it was a messy divorce to where we had to separate communications between myself and my father so for four years I went to a high school where I didn't speak to my father and he taught there and then it got difficult even more after that because all of a sudden this kid shows up and says that he's my brother, right? And not only that, but he has the same name as me. Not my last name, my first name, right? So I had to figure this out. It was the kid in the commons area that, that figured out. It was this kid named Tommy, right? He told me what had happened. We were hanging out in the common area, which I also want to talk about. Common area is where everybody intersects right? I learned very, much, very early. It's like a lot of things happen in a common area. You build a common area for people, whether it's in your office, a garden, wherever, you're going to build a place where people come together. They might learn together. They might work together. It's a very important space. And he said, he said, yeah, he was my stepbrother. My father, my father had, we had lived in Jeffersonville. He moved to Louisville, got married. I didn't even know. Our family stopped communicating altogether. All right. He moved to Louisville. He got married. They had a son, or she had a son named Tommy, same age as I was. They didn't get along. Tommy had to move out. Tommy had to go and live with his real father. His real father just happened to live in Jeffersonville, <laughs> right, where my father taught school and I had to go to school and now we got two Toms in the same school that don't talk to their fathers who is actually a teacher in the school. I already had some problems learning, right? <laughs> and now I'm in a situation where I'm not really happy and going to school every day. People didn't communicate. It was tough. But you know what? I had, I had an experience with my mother who was there by my side through the whole thing the whole thing. She kept telling me, you know what? You can make it happen. You can do anything. I learned that art was an, something that I could continue to express myself, get my feelings out. I used it every day. Went to college. Started, actually went, moved to Chicago. I was in galleries and it was all about that lack of communication, single parenting, divorce, all those things. I was able to be a part of an advertising agency here. So how many people from Barefoot? Awesome. Thank you for coming out. Barefoot Advertising. So I learned uh, advertising. Doug kind of brought me in and, and, and brought me through that experience. I learned so much from them. It also gave me the ability to have some freedom, too. I had a studio right a block away in Glendora Street, um, where after work I could come and do my own artwork, too. 
I had an experience where the Contemporary Art Center brought fourth graders through local artist studios. I was a part of that. It changed my life. It changed my life because the kids got to make art with me. They left, and one of the volunteers, or a person that was helping me at the time, said, you know what, these kids are never going to forget, never going to forget their experience here. That was the first time that I started really thinking about my life, my experiences, 147,000 hours of being a kid, right? And I looked back at my life and I was like, you know what? Um, I've had some struggles, um, went through this crazy divorce, through four years of not knowing family, communicating what was happening. Um, I've made artwork about it, but is it really changing lives? It's probably reinforcing what all of us know here, all those struggles today. All of my artwork was doing was reinforcing that. So I spent some time and I really thought about it. I thought, okay, you know what? How can I take my childhood and make a better life for someone else, but still using the things that I really enjoy to do? Art, gardening, making t-shirts, right? Don't have a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of experience in school about it, but I do have these life experiences. So I created Happ Incorporated. Our goal is to bring together families so they can communicate, learn together, express themselves. It's been a wonderful blessing. We have grown to where um, this, we're celebrating our 15th anniversary in March. So it's been a really incredible, incredible journey. <coughs> and what I would like to do is just encourage everyone here to think back on their lives. Everyone has a tag, right? It's like, what, what did you do when you were bored? There was a study that came out that said, you know what, when you turn age 10 or 11, when you turn 10 or 11, and you go to your parents and they, you say, Mom, you know, what do I do? And they say, oh, go find something to do, right? And you, you have the freedom to go and do that. What was it? It could have been riding a bike. It could have been making art. It could have been, in my case, fishing. I still haven't figured out how to bring fishing in to happen yet. <laughs> so whatever you do, did at that point is something that you're going to aspire to do on your free time, your, maybe even your job, your workplace, for the rest of your life. I feel like I got a responsibility, since we all went through childhood, is to try and influence in as many different ways, give opportunities for kids to explore and learn all kinds of different things, whether it's gardening, art, making t-shirts, it doesn't matter. Taking things that I enjoyed as a kid and being able to share it with someone else, it's easy. You don't have to be an expert at it. The one thing you have to do is try. That's all you have to do. You will become an expert. You will be able to help a future generation. Thank you very much. We have a couple minutes for Q&A. Um, if anybody has any questions or... Hi. Uh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so, did you jump right into Happen uh, and start again as a full time business, or was this like, kind of like a part time thing for a while trying to like, break even? No, I, you know what? Um, I, I went to Doug, um, the founder of Barefoot, and just told him what I was thinking about, and he said, um, he was all for it, you know, and it, it took us, but it did take us some time, right? It took us about six months to figure out, um, you know, the, the business. I felt very comfortable. We've become a core supplier for P&G. Things are really um, going well. I really looked at my life during that time and, and, and like I didn't have any responsibilities. I wasn't married, don't know kids, part of a successful company. You know, I always think, you know, Swiffer for Breeze. I mean, it's like, you know, that gave me an opportunity to, to, to really do something um, and make happen. And, and so, no, I, I, I sold all of my partnership back to Doug, um, and then I took that little chunk of money, and I, that's what we started with. And I figured it out, and I treated it like an art project. I had no idea it would last 15 years. I really didn't. I thought it would last three years, and I had enough money to do that. So it paid the rent, it paid um, staffing, it paid for supplies and all those things. And uh, I put everything into it. Um, some of the most creative times ever, though, because, you know, I, I, I was allowed this freedom to be able to create, create this world 
um, that I would never have had an opportunity to do. Talk about wow moments. What was your wow moment that happened when you realized that you had something of value? Um, there's been there's been a lot. I I think. The first one. First initial years. I think I think that it's after the well. We used to have a graduation. I'll tell you this. We used to have a graduation. We would bring in a cake and everything, and um, and the kids would get, get their happen crowns. And our first class that we had, um, the kids were coming up and getting their certificates. And I looked over, and there was a mom in tears, right? And she was just so proud. She came up then and got her pictures taken and and, and all of it together. And I was like, you know what? I uh, we've created a program here that really has an emotional impact for kids and parents. I feel like there are so many things going on in this city that are connecting kids with art, and there are so many people involved in the arts. Like, what are future connections and team ups for Happen, which I'm assuming happens in Northside? Um, you know, artworks with Par, with you know the different projects that are going on. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm super excited about. I mean, you, and there's amazing amount of stuff, not just in Northside, but all through Greater Cincinnati. I mean, just this tremendous things. And um, we're working with a lot of community centers, different programs, different schools. Um, I tell you, the biggest thing that I think that we can do is to uh, give advice. You know, I mean, we work with different programs. We were part of the Pro Par Miniature Program. Uh, they had a miniature art show, um, and so we had some of our Toy Lab toys in there. I mean, we 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 definitely work with all these different organizations. But I think that the best thing that we can do is uh, is just share um, our experiences. Um, and I, I always tell people I can't tell them with the right way to do things because I've done a tremendous amount of things wrong, you know, every day. But I, but I can tell them what our mistakes are and hopefully they can grow and build. Anyone else? Do you have any uh, programs for toddlers or two years old or so? We, we, have, um, we have an early childhood class that's all about ceramics. So it goes three to five. And that is uh, exploring pinch pots and coil pots and all those activities. We have um, a session that is for infants, and that's where you can reserve a place on, uh, on Sunday. You reserve 45 minutes, come in our studio, it's totally free, and I cut you five, five slabs of clay, and you do handprints and footprints in clay. All right? We do five because you get to keep one, and then it goes out to, you know, we figure you're going to give them to grandparents and aunts and uncles and, and all those people. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids, obviously. Um, what do you think is kind of a critical issue with kids these days? Um, I, I well, I focus on six to twelve. We, I mean, we've got all ages, six to twelve, because I feel like that is a time of bonding, of building trust, awareness, all those things, and those that that we team them up, right? It's either parent or child, or we team them up with a mentor, and I feel like having an adult learn and grow and move through there you know and what I didn't talk about today is that you know when I really looked back at my life um, and made this decision um, I looked back at uh, the special times that I had with my my father you know and there was a swim coach who gave away uh, free swim lessons to an adult and a child right and my dad enrolled us in that session and we learned to swim together you know I look back at it and it's like I don't remember the whole thing I just remember us treading water together or looking at each other underneath the water for the first time. I remember all those things. Those things were so special. That's spending time with your kids, you know, just even hanging out with them. That's the most important thing. Since you're a big kid, does your mom ever come and work on our projects that you have? You know what? She'll, not only that, but she'll surprise us. Like, so uh, about three weeks ago, she surprised, she drove up from Louisville, and uh, she showed up to meet the breadwinners, the teens. And, and uh, she just stayed for an hour, and then a friend of her drove, drove her back, but um, she wanted to meet the kids. So she uh, is as involved as she can be at her age, you know? But the one thing that she does do is she shows up, um, she shows up every, uh, uh, every year for the Lights, Camera, Learning, and Action program, which is our film program, and um, we do the Happen Cheer. So the, uh, and I'll tell you what the cheer is here. The cheer is, um, all the kids, 
say, or we count to three, all the kids say, you can make it happen, and then we clap three times, and then all the adults say, just make it through college, <laughs> all right? And she stands up, and she, we say that cheer to her, because that cheer really came from her. Growing up, that's what I heard. That's what my mom told me all the time. And I know that people say, hey, well, you know, you're, we're empowering kids too much and tell them they can be president when they can't and playing ball when they can or any of those things. That's not what that's about. You can make it happen. You can do anything. That's about me just trying to get through third grade spelling class, right, spelling bee, or being able to recite a poem, right, or being able to just run in, with everyone else. That's what that's about. And then getting through high school. I told you that experience. My mom was just like, just make it through college, Tommy. That's it. She knew that college was going to be an outlet for me, not only to have a successful job and income, but also to get out of where I was growing up, to move on and experience something in another place. Kind of follow up to his question, um, like, and what you, in your answer is um, something that I see as like a huge problem. Um, in society and communities is fatherlessness. And I wonder, like, do you see a lot of kids that are from, like, you know, a lot of single moms and, and kids coming in? And, like, is that, is that something you guys experience and address in any way? Every day. I mean, I experienced it, and I would say that probably over half of the people in this room experience it, right? In some level. In some level, right? They're not there all the time. Um, and that's where I say, you know what? Try. Mm -hmm. Be, get a part of a childhood. So you don't have to be an expertise. You don't have to go to a, an organization like Happen either. You can start, I don't know, if you love to read books, you know, start a book club in your neighborhood. If you love to watch film, you know, start a film club in your neighborhood. I don't know, be a part of someone's life. And actually, you know, me growing up, I had people that came in and out of my life uh, that helped in that void. Um, there's one gentleman who um, had his own plane um, little Cessna four-seater, friends of my, my family, and he would take me flying. I would take care of his plane, and he'd take me flying. We'd go up on the weekends. I got so good at age 16, 17, I was flying so much I would be able to do touch and goes, you know, and have a great time. I loved it, absolutely love it. If you look at my iPad, I have so many flight simulators on there, right? I mean, that's what I love to do, right? And it all came from this guy just, I mean, he just took the time to hang out with me. He tried. I, I don't know about this person's success. I mean, so when we first started, it's 15 years ago, so the kids in the very first class are now in their 20s, right? I will tell you this experience that I know that, you know, I can't quantify all these things because you just never know the impact that's going to happen later on. Just like that swim coach, I don't remember his name, his face, or any of those things, right? But I just remember the time that I had with my father and learning together and hanging out together. And so I was walking down, I was walking down Hamilton Avenue, going to the hardware store, and I had my Happen shirt on, and this guy with a beard, right, in his 20s, he walks by me, and uh, he just points out, I could tell he's in a hurry, and, I'm a, and he, he just points at my shirt, and he goes, I was a part of that, right, and it stopped me. And then I turned around, and he kept walking, but he was kind of walking backwards, and I, I yelled out to him, I was like, what do you remember, right? And then I was, you know, right off the bat, I would think, okay, does he remember me, right? Or does he remember the alien or the cowboy or any of the activities, right? And I could see, because he stopped and looked at me, and I could see he didn't remember me. He couldn't, he, he, he couldn't remember my face. The first thing he said, the only thing he said, he looked at me, he goes, my mother took me. And I was like, wow, that's it. That's it. That's exactly what we're trying to do. We're bringing families together. What he remembered, the first thing out of his mouth, is that his mom took him through our classes. Families being brought together. That to me, I can't ever write that in a grant. I can't ever put it in a, in a sponsorship. I, I can't ever quantify that. Those, but those little moments happen that goes, you know what? Tommy, you're doing the right thing. That's what you're supposed to be doing right now. Anything else? Any other questions? Thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. The, the one thing I just really want to, as you leave today, is just think about is how you can try. That's all. Thank you and have a great day.